Well, hello, everybody. Um, how is everybody doing? Uh, welcome to uh, another another of our Green Thumb series for the Harris County Master Gardeners, where we'll be talking with uh, a nice gentleman in just a few minutes about um, spring vegetable gardening. A uh, couple of things here real quick as we're getting going. Uh, I would like to welcome you once again to Green Thumb Gardening Series. Uh, my name is John Schaefer. Uh, I'm with the Harris County Public Library, and it is my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce one of our very special guest uh, today, uh, Mr. Rick Costanago. And uh, he'll be talking with you in just a few moments. Um, and I'll get you his bio in a second, but I want to tell everybody about questions because we would love, love, love to get lots of questions and to answer all those questions for you. Um, and so we have people monitoring all different uh, aspects aspects of the way you can watch this from the uh, from the YouTube to the Facebook. We have Master Gardeners watching this. So if you have questions, please get them in. Uh, now, let me introduce uh, the gentleman sitting right next to me, Mr. Rick. Uh, Rick is a proud graduate of the Texas Tech University. Get your guns up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he got his degree in petroleum engineering uh, after working 40 years in the oil industry. That's a long time, Rick. Uh, he retired and became a Harris County Master Gardener. He currently volunteers at the Genoa Friendship Gardens uh, several times a week where he oversees vegetable production. So you know he knows what he's talking about. Uh, Rick also set up a partnership with the Heights Interfaith Ministries Food Pantry to donate the produce from uh, the garden. Last year, they donated 1,000 pounds of produce. Uh, he's also a member of the GFG uh, Steering Committee and a member of the Harris County Master Gardeners Board of Directors. Uh, it's uh, really nice to have you here, Rick. How are you doing? Great, great. Well, good to have you. We'll get started here in just a couple of seconds. Once again, if you have a question, uh, please feel free to type it into your comment section. We'll be looking at those. We might be answering some of those as we go. We'll also pause about midway through Rick's presentation and uh, take some of your questions. Get them. We'll also do questions uh, at the end. I, I know Rick uh, loves to get those questions. So without further ado here, let's see if we can uh, get this going here. Um, Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you and... Uh, let you let you do your stuff. <laughs> okay, John. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, as we get started, one thing I want to explain, as, as shown on this slide, is that the master gardeners are basically trained by the uh, AgriLife Extension, um, and our whole goal is uh, to help them in the mission of bringing relevant, research-based information about horticulture to the public. So that's a, a big part of what we do. Uh, next slide. Uh, before I get started on the presentation of spring veggies, um, I wanna uh, put a little advertisement in there for our plant sales. Uh, we have multiple plant sales, both on the Northwest side, um, and, as well as on the uh, Southeast, which is in uh, Genoa Friendship Gardens. We just finished up our tomato sale uh, this past weekend. Um, but you see, we'll have multiple sales in March, April, and May, as well as uh, we're having a, a sale at the Berry Center um, in uh, March and a final sale at the Northwest site in April. Next slide. Um, and a pitch for the Green Thumb series, uh, which is what you're watching now. You'll see uh, we do them multiple times. Um, so the uh, Harris County Public Library Facebook Live is going on now, and we have multiple ones coming up March, April. You can get that list. I'm sure the, uh, uh, the link to this schedule will be posted in the chat room as well. Next slide. One final adver advertisement. Um, the presentation I'm gonna give today is spring vegetables, but it's heavily focused on tomatoes. Um, tomatoes seem to be one of the biggest um, vegetables that are grown uh, at home. Um, and we're actually, uh, I'm gonna conduct a workshop this Saturday at Genoa Friendship Gardens, uh, address is listed there. Um, fee is $25 and you get to take home, or $20, sorry. And everyone gets to take home a, a tomato and some, uh, uh, fertilizer as well. And what we'll do is show how to take the tomato from a transplant into the garden, uh, various ways to plant them. Next slide. 
So starting with the presentation, why, why do we do home gardening? Uh, uh, well, the easiest answer is that the veggies just taste better. Uh, a main reason for that is because you control the pest management practices. You know exactly what you put on the plants, when you put it there. Um, it's good exercise to get out and, and uh, into the garden. Uh, and it's a great activity, uh, especially for kids. Uh, kids can easily dig and get dirty in the dirt with you while you garden. Next slide. So some things to consider. We're taking you from scratch uh, all the way through uh, creating your garden is what we'll talk about first off. And then we'll talk about the specific vegetables. Uh, so things to consider is the location of your garden, um, the space that you have available, and your local planting zone. Now, you need to know this for planting times, the varieties that you can use, and you'll also get information on frost dates, which are key to planting vegetables. And we'll talk all about this as I go, as I go further into the presentation. Next slide. So when we talk about the garden location, what we're looking for is an area of your yard that can receive about eight hours of sunlight. Um, you can grow plenty of vegetables with less than eight hours of sunlight, but eight is, is really an ideal uh, amount of sunlight. You need to have some good, rich soil, um, and uh, it, it needs to be amended here uh, off and on, and I'll tell you all about that here in just a minute. Uh, free of competing, uh, of competition, such as buildings uh, that might be in the way or other plants. Trees are another one that really um, can hamper growing some uh, vegetables in your garden. You need to have a water source that is uh, close by, um, good air circulation, and it needs to be visible. And the reason we say it needs to be visible, like from the window kitchen or from the back, uh, back of the house, is because when you tend to be able to see it, you tend to go out there in the garden. Next slide. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about the different kinds of, gar uh, of gardening. Raised beds is uh, what we use out at Genoa Friendship Garden. Um, the ideal raised bed is about four feet across, and that is if you can get around both sides of it. If you can only work from one side, then it should be about two and a half feet uh, is max. And that's because that's the maximum distance that most people can reach to reach the center of the bed. You don't want to step in your uh, raised bed, especially after you've prepared it. Beds that are 8 to uh, 12 feet high are, are great starters. Um, avoid treated lumber. Uh, a good rot-resistant wood, such as a cedar or redwood, is ideal. Uh, stones or cinder blocks can be used as well. Um, and I'm going to mention this a couple of times, but if you're starting from scratch, the soil is key, okay? So you need to fill it with a good quality garden soil. And uh, there are ver various makes of these. I would, I would go more towards my um, neighborhood nursery to find a good quality garden soil that's made for our area. Uh, so you want to fill your, your bed with about two thirds of the garden soil and about a third of compost to start with. Next slide. Contain, uh, veggies and containers is very easy to do and very doable as well if you just don't have much of a yard or if you're more of a patio uh, vegetable planter, such as if you live in an apartment. The, um, uh, they do take more care. So because you do have a smaller area for the plant to live, it's going to require a bit more water uh, and probably uh, more often fertilizing than you would in a larger bed. Um, Large containers are better. So I would think for a tomato, for example, a nice 18 inch pot, uh, 18 inch across the top would work beautifully for that. You can also fit in a uh, uh, tomato cage as well. Um, now in pots, you need to get a good potting media. Do not ever use a garden soil in your pots. It'll just uh, compact too much and then you won't have uh, any drainage left. So in pots, two thirds of a good potting media and a third compost. So that 
uh, ratio stays. Um, and it will help you with a nice loose uh, uh, reducing compaction, like I mentioned earlier, and it will help improve drainage. You can see on the picture on the um, uh, lower uh, right, those are some of the tubs we use at Genoa Friendship Garden, just to give examples. Uh, so when the public comes out and looks at our garden, you can see what, what we grow in pots as well. Next slide. So like I said, the ideal location um, can look like any of these pictures. You can have lots of pots on your uh, balcony of an apartment. Um, you can do raised beds, of course. Uh, you can plant directly in the ground. Is, uh, or you can have more of a commercial type operation as well. Just depends on the room you have. Next slide. So let's talk about soil since that is the most important. You know, you, maybe you have or have not heard the adage, you never want to put a $50 plant in a $5 soil. You can put a $5 plant in a $50 soil for sure. But so soil is the key. Um, a good pH is around six to six and a half. Uh, good organic material and that you'll get that good uh, uh, percentage of organic matter in your content if you use about two thirds of a good quality garden soil or potting media and a third of compost. It'll keep it nice and airy um, and you're gonna have a nice sandy to sandy loam texture, pretty much the color of what you see in the picture uh, on the uh, right hand side. Next. We recommend, we being master gardeners, recommend that you get your soil tested um, at least every three to four years. Um, you can see the website at the bottom of this slide in red, uh, soiltesting.camu.edu. And at this website, they'll give you the form, which is shown on the left-hand side. You just fill out the form. It'll give you all the instructions you need on how to collect your sample and where to send your sample to. Samples, uh, when I did last time, was about $12 a sample for a basic analysis. And the analysis you get is what is shown on the right-hand portion of the slide. In that analysis, they'll tell you all the main nutrients and where you stand, uh, where that soil stands with those main nutrients. For example, here, it is showing that we need 1.3, it's awfully small, but it's about 1.3 uh, cubic feet per thousand square feet of, or, or 1.3 pounds per thousand square feet of uh, garden. Um, so when you have a lack in nutrients, how do we get those nutrients back into the soil? Next slide. Well, we use fertilizer. I'm gonna talk about fertilizer for just a minute. Uh, because it is key to getting those nutrients back in the fertilizer. We've all seen the three numbers on the bag. For example, the little uh, um, fertilizer bag here at the bottom of this slide says 7, 15, and 10. And those stand for different uh, minerals, such as the nitrogen is the first letter, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The way I like to think of this is up, down, and all around. So nitrogen is the up. So it really helps intensify the greening color of your leaves and, and plant. Um, down is phosphorus, which is great for maintaining a good, healthy root system. Uh, also helps with the uh, blooming and the fruiting of your, of your plant. And then the K all around uh, potassium is just for the general vitality, uh, vitality of the plant. Um, we always recommend complete fertilizers, which means that there's a number in every one of the slots. So for example, um, a 20 zero, 0 which is predominantly nitrogen, is not a complete fertilizer. So it has to have a number in all three slots. You need to look and see, is your plant a heavy feeder or a light feeder? Um, and uh, improve, you can improve the soil structure by using compost as well, which is what I mentioned. So real briefly, uh, what the three numbers stand for are they are the percentage by weight 
of each one of those uh, nutrients in the bag. So for example, in, in, the, in the bag I'm showing here, it's 7% nitrogen. So for a 40 pound bag, that's just under three pounds or 2.8 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, potassium is, is oh, I'm sorry, phosphorus is 15%. So it's about six pounds in that bag. And uh, potassium is 10%. So it's about four pounds of potassium in the bag. So that, that right there is about just under 13 pounds. So what is the remaining 40 pounds in that bag contain? Well, it contains a lot of filler. Um, and that's why we recommend that if you go to your local nurseries, they'll, they'll have fertilizers that are made specifically for our region. Um, and the fillers are uh, really high quality. So things like Nitrofrost, Microlife, um, Medina, all of those uh, have formula, and there's others as well. Um, I would try to avoid um, standard big fertilizer, uh, fertilizers from uh, big box stores. They they call themselves, if uh, this is actually made for Southern lawns, well, that's made for Georgia as well, because uh, they're Southern lawns. So it works in both places. Well, it doesn't work as good here in South Texas. So just a word of advice there. Next slide. So while we're talking about fertilizers, we have what we call slow release fertilizers. Um, and I will use a slow release fertilizer when I uh, initially prep the bed um, before I plant. Um, the, the plants can absorb these nutrients continuously uh, over a long range of time, usually uh, a couple of months uh, at least, if not three months. Next slide. And we have soluble fertilizers, uh, which are good. They can, uh, the nutrients are available immediately to the plant, um, and they're available in a form that the plant can take up easily. The only thing I would mention um, about these is make sure you read the label, um, especially the liquid fertilizers. Uh, if you spray the leaves, which is a good practice because they can be absorbed through the uh, leaves and stems as well. Um, you, you, have, you, you can have a tendency to burn the plant, uh, especially if you do it too uh, in the sun, sunlight uh, when it's too hot. And that usually means about 80 degrees. So 80 degrees or less is, is fine to apply these. Um, and they're often a, a, a bit less expensive as well. Next slide. So we, we talked about preparing your bed. Now we're getting ready to plant in the bed. So I mentioned earlier that we know, need to know our planting zone. It's known as hardiness zones. You can find these at various places on the internet. Houston area or the Harris County area, you can see there, or it's half of it or a good portion is in 9A and a bit to the north is in 8B as well. So you need to know that, and I'll show you why here in just a second, but you need to know your hardiness zone that you're in. If you're in Dallas, you have a whole different uh, planting regimes and uh, varieties of plants that work the best up there. Next slide. So here's a handy dandy um, vegetable garden planting dates that was specifically designed for Harris County. Um, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide as well. Um, you can see the website uh, is listed there or will be listed in the comments as well um, on where to get this uh, planting guide. But in the dark green, it shows the ideal um, planting times. Um, and the lighter green is kind of the shoulder planting season. Uh, it still work, but it's not ideal. Um, and it says up there in the uh, upper left uh, in green, uh, if you can read that, there you go. It says uh, planting times are for seeds unless otherwise noted. Um, there's one exception to this. When you go down, let's go all the way down to tomatoes. Uh, where the red arrow is, um, that planting time, which is in the um, uh, in the February to March time frame, uh, is for transplants. That is not for seeds, so it should say transplants in there. 
we prepared our seeds uh, out of out of the Genoa Friendship Gardens uh, back the end of December, but early January is a, a wonderful time to do it as well. So what this chart also shows at the very bottom are the uh, the last frost dates that we have, and they show it for both Bush uh, and um, Hobby Airport, which is kind of north and south Harris County. And it also shows the average first frost date. So you'll want to plant certain plants like tomatoes, uh, keeping that in mind. And I'll show you what I mean here in just a minute. Next slide. So let's talk about varieties. We're, uh, uh, what varieties work great in Houston? I'm going to tell you a bunch of different varieties as we go through the different vegetables. Um, but you can also find this information at the uh, Texas A&M AgriLife uh, website. Uh, you can see there's websites there that talk all about the varieties. And they're specifically for zones 8B or 9A, which is our Harris County area. Next slide. Next slide, John. Thank you, John. So when you go to that website, you're going to see a couple of pages that look like this for all the different varieties of vegetables. Since we're, I'm mo mainly focused on tomatoes, uh, you can see that list of tomatoes that we have there that work really well. So if you're just starting uh, with uh, planting tomatoes, uh, and you're kind of a beginner at it, I would stick with things like Juliet's, which is a smaller tomato, um, but it's very tasty. Uh, going down the list, the uh, Bush Early Girl or the Celebrity Champion all work really well in uh, our climates. Are these the only, one, uh, only tomatoes that will grow in uh, our area? No. Um, but if you want to have success right off the bat, I would recommend staying with one of these types of tomatoes. Um, after you get good at it, you can start practicing with other varieties, uh, which is what we do out at the garden. We'll test a lot of different varieties um, to make sure with uh, an AgriLife agent to make sure they do work in this uh, southern region. Next slide, please. So a couple of other things we're going to talk about before we get on to um, the vegetables themselves. Again, you want your area that you're planting in to be um, to drain well. And that's one of the big reasons we uh, talk about raised beds. Um, so when you're actually adding the moisture or the water to your beds, uh, a drip irrigation is ideal. Um, as it says, there are probably the most common mistake we find with uh, more of the beginner gardeners is too much water. Um, your vegetables will need anywhere from one to two inches. So one inch right now, this time of uh, time of year, all the way up to two inches when we get into our July, August heat spells um, is ideal. So what does that mean? Well, uh, an inch of water in a hundred square foot bed. So our beds at Genoa are four feet wide by 25 feet long. That's a hundred square feet. So one inch of water is about 65 gallons um, over that hundred square feet. And you'll want to apply that at least weekly. Uh, like I mentioned, raised beds are ideal. And uh, by using the compost, uh, it'll help hold moisture and just also improve the drainage. Next slide. Finally, we get into talking about mulch. Well, the, the best reason for mulch is it helps retain the moisture that you put on your plants. Um, it will help regulate the soil temperature. So in the very hot, hot months, it'll help keep it a little bit cooler. Um, and it's great for weed control as well. Um, you don't have to do as much weeding. Um, types of, of mulch to use, well, compost is a great mulch. It just tends to be a bit more expensive. Things like leaves, pine needles, straw, that's all good uh, mulch material. Next slide. So before we get on to talking about vegetables, uh, John, are there any questions? 
Yes, uh, we have some amazing questions that have come in. Um, wanted to get a couple of those out. Uh, Anita um, was asking about seeds and uh, what seeds she should start now. And I know you mentioned a couple of different brands of tomatoes, but I um, uh, wonder about maybe brands or types or obviously, the, you know, which type of seeds are the best? So um, the uh, seeds, uh, the key to seeds is where you get them. Um, I, I, I wouldn't advertise getting them at big box stores. They don't tend to take care of them properly. Um, we use a lot from uh, mail orders, uh, Johnny's, uh, Pan American. Uh, there are a variety of seed companies out there. And we'll order our year's um, uh, worth of seeds most of the time in the uh, January, February timeframe. Because when they're shipped to us in South Texas, they stay nice and cool. And then we put our seeds in the refrigerator until they're ready to use. A lot of big box stores just leave seeds out in the sunshine and they just don't have the same success rate as you get yeah. from, from other seed manufacturers. Okay. And Ann K asks, um, are there some plants that can be planted throughout the year? Are there any, any types of tomatoes maybe that we can, you know, plant, you know, uh, at different times? Yeah, so we uh, uh, will plant tomatoes, for example, twice a year. Um, okay. We'll do one in the spring, which we're doing our, our workshop, which I'll talk more about. So we're going to plant all our tomatoes on February 25th out at the garden. Um, okay. And then we'll do another planting the end of September. Um, okay. During the winter, tomatoes do not like uh, freezing weather. So they will not make it through the winter. But in the winter time, and I'll talk about that in my upcoming uh, fall vegetable presentation in a few months, uh, things like all your leafy vegetables are great over uh, the winter. You'll need to cover them when you get a freeze, but they're easier to right. cover, like your lettuces, your chart, and that type. Okay. And we had a great question from Deborah, which I think we all want to know. And when I saw it, I was like, I need to know this as well. Um, if you happen to have a feral cat in your neighborhood that is using your garden for maybe a litter box, perhaps, um, right. you, uh, do you need to replace that soil? Is this something you need to really, uh, uh, do you know, do you need to go full fledged and completely replace No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I wouldn't say you need to replace the soil, um, but it does bring up a good point. You'll see a lot of uh, manure being sold to help enrich gardens. Manure is good if it is taken from an animal that does not eat meat, okay? Cats and dogs eat meat, so it's not good fertilizer, okay? Uh, horses, cows, they all don't eat meat. Chickens, um, so that uh, manure is fine to use. I would say you just need to amend the, the soil, uh, remove as much as you can. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and if you but have you a cat that you can it. it. They make those great little shovels with the holes in them. So, you know, it, it right. works out. <laughs> right. <laughs> and one last question before we move on. Uh, Mona was wondering uh, if watering with a hose, how long to water each plant uh, to get one inch? Is there a rule of thumb maybe for watering? Yeah. So if you get your watering, get, uh, just pick yourself a, 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 a container and turn on your hose, stick it in the container and see how long it takes you to get to uh, about an inch of water. Okay. Um, and it'll take a garden hose probably in the five to 10 second range. So when you're watering with a hose, keep it very close to the root system and just water, uh, uh, try not to water any of the leaves if you can. Okay. Good. There you go. Well, Rick, let me let you get back into it. I, I can't wait to hear more. And we'll pause again. Keep those questions coming if you're watching, and uh, we will definitely get to those uh, at the end of the broadcast. So, uh, Rick, I'll let you continue on. Great, John. Thank you. So we're going to talk about uh, a variety of vegetables, and I'm going to talk about them in, the, in, in families. So the nightshade family of vegetables include tomatoes, peppers, uh, eggplant, uh, potatoes and tomatillas. The reason we talk about um, families of vegetables is a really good practice to use, and not everyone can do this, is to rotate, it's called crop rotation. So if you plant tomatoes this spring in a certain area in your garden, don't plant peppers in that same area or eggplant in that same area. 
plant uh, beans or a lagoon out of a different family. It helps to keep soil borne diseases at a minimum. That it, when you keep planting tomatoes in the same space, um, some people don't have the luxury of being able to rotate crops. And when that is the case, then you just need to constantly amend your soil very well um, with uh, the nutrients and the compost. Um, anyway, so that's why we talk about families when, we, when I go through this presentation. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk mostly, uh, I'm going to talk heavily about tomatoes. Um, so when you go to your local nursery to pick up some tomatoes, if you didn't do them from seed, and I'm going to show you how to do them from seed as well, um, you want to find varieties that are resistant to things like uh, wilt and different kinds of nematodes. And those are the letters you'll see at the end of the um, uh, on the label. And if they don't have it marked uh, at your local nursery, ask them what varieties, uh, what these plants are resistant to. And you can see the letters down at the footnote at the very bottom. They stand for the, the, the resistant uh, type, if we will. You want to get fairly large and vigorous plants. Um, when you are planting, um, you're going to want to incorporate anywhere from a quarter to a half cup of a complete uh, fertilizer. Um, we, we say slow release here. Um, so this is a good point uh, for me to talk about uh, fertilize and preparing your bed for uh, planting. So we will every um, before we plant, so twice a year, um, uh, I will add three cubic feet of compost and four pounds of a complete fertilizer per hundred square feet. I mentioned earlier, each one of our beds are a hundred square feet, how convenient that is. Um, so that's what we'll put in there before we plant. And it's usually done two weeks before we plant. Um, so that's when I say soil preparation, that's what I mean, uh, adding your compost, and we'll add it twice a year before we plant and the fertilizer as well. Um, for tomatoes, you're gonna need to apply uh, weekly to every other week, some more nutrients to the plants. Tomatoes are heavy feeders, uh, so they will require more nutrition throughout the, uh, throughout the year. So you'll want to put, or throughout the growing season, you'll want to put anywhere from two to three tablespoons uh, again, a complete fertilizer can be a 10-10-10, a 13-13-13 is what we use out there. And it's not slow. That one is not slow release. We want the nutrients to get in there pretty quickly. And we'll treat it um, about when we get our first cluster of flowers. And then again, when we get our first fruit setting. And then after that, we'll do it probably every two weeks. Uh, you can do it more often, uh, but I'd use a lighter coating of fertilizer if you do it more often. Next slide. Temperature is the key to tomatoes fruiting. Um, and the key temperature is the nighttime temperature. So nighttime temperatures below 50 degrees will de delay uh, the time from pollination to fertilization and you may have flower drop. Um, Nighttime temperatures above the mid 70s or so, again, will promote flower drop. So that's why our ideal growing season uh, starts around the end of February, early March. And what I have listed at the bottom there is the, for Harris County, our average high and low temperatures for March, it's 51 degrees, perfect timing. Your uh, April 58, May, and now when we get to June, we're starting to, to reach to the maximum um, temperatures that you want flowering to occur on your tomatoes. But by that time, you're going to have very mature, hardy tomato plants, and they'll be more, will, more able to resist the higher temperatures in the evening or in the uh, nighttime than uh, young plants will be. So plant them uh, again around the uh, late February, early March time frame, and you'll have great tomatoes all spring and into the summer as well. Next slide. So how do we do it starting from seed? Well, we'll go out and get some clean seed trays that I show here on the left-hand side. 
Uh, those are uh, are fairly inexpensive. You can find them at your uh, local grocery store. Uh, I'm sorry, your local uh, nursery. Um, egg cartons work well uh, as well. Uh, so you just will clean those trays or egg cartons. Uh, you'll get a good propagation uh, mixing soil. Uh, you can find these again at your uh, local nurseries and just fill the trays. And once you fill the trays, you'll want to plant the seeds. Tomato seeds are fairly small. You'll want to plant them about a quarter of an inch deep. When we do trials, which we have done trials on seeds uh, that we planted this past fall, we make sure we get one seed per pack per um, slot so that we can also judge uh, germination rates on did the manufacturer say it's 93% germination rate of these seeds? And what that means is 93% of the seeds will produce a plant or, or was it less? So we'll just keep track of that. Home gardeners, I'd put two or three seeds in each just to make sure you get one that comes up. Okay. Next slide, please. So after about a week, your plant should start to germinate. Um, you can see the little plants starting to germinate here. Um, if you are not getting having germination within a week, you'll need to check some things like the temperature. Is the temperature just too low? Do you need to put a warming uh, tray underneath your, your seedlings? Um, do you have enough light from uh, most of the time when you start with seeds, it's going to be uh, indoors. Uh, so do you have some good uh, grow lights that you can put on it? And are they getting enough water? Those are all the things to check if your, your tomatoes are not germinating within the first week. Next slide. Um, so here you can see after about three to four weeks um, of growing your in your seed tray, um, it's time to bump them up into bigger pots, up to four inch pots. The key here is when you look at the tomato plant itself, it should have in the neighborhood of three to four leaves on it. When it when that occurs, it is time to bump up into a bigger pot. Um, here we're talking about four inch pots. Next slide. So bumping it up into four inch pots, uh, you can kind of see the pots in the center picture, but on the uh, left hand side, we just take the entire soil out of the seed tray. And with this sophisticated tool we have, it's called a plastic spoon. <laughs> just make a hole in the uh, soil in the four inch pot and put it in there at the same depth that the seedling is currently at, or that the new plant is currently at in the seed tray. And uh, that's all there is to bumping it up to a four inch pot. Now, some people will wait for them to get larger. Oh, next slide. Oh, I think we skipped one. There you go. So after five weeks, this is just to give you an idea after five weeks, uh, what they might look like. Uh, and after seven weeks, you can see they've grown quite a bit in just a couple of weeks. Some people at this stage will take them and bump them up into a larger container yet. We'll just take them straight into the, uh, uh, the beds outside and plant them uh, directly in the ground. Uh, next slide. So the ideal time to plant them, uh, as it says there on the uh, right-hand side, is around 10 weeks. Anywhere in the eight to 10 weeks, you can plant them outside. The reason I have 12 weeks labeled on the top of this is these were tomatoes we were doing for a trial this fall. And uh, if you'll remember, so the ideal time to plant them would have been early to mid-September. But if you'll recall, early to mid-September, we were having nighttime temperatures that were 85 degrees, um, uh, 80 to 85 degrees. And I just thought that that's not going to give these uh, young tomatoes a good fighting chance. So we waited a couple of more weeks until the end of September. And luckily, we started getting nighttime temperatures falling back into the 70s, uh, which was great. But then the thing we contended with was, OK, when is our first freeze date? As I showed you on the other um, chart, the planting chart, the freeze date for us, which is uh, Genoa Friendship Garden, which we are very close to Hobby uh, Airport, was ar uh, around uh, December 20th. Um, so 12 weeks, um, 
or the uh, uh, in other words, it gave us uh, about 80 days to get from transplant to um, fruit. So the plants we were planting, we planted Juliet's. They have a 60-day maturity from, from transplant to fruit. Um, we also tried uh, some new ones from Pan American called the Sun Dipper and the Blushing Star. Uh, they were a little bit closer. So we were hoping we would get a, la a later frost is what you're banking on. That didn't happen. So we ended up picking a bunch of green tomatoes, which were delicious as well. And a lot of them ripened right there on the uh, on your kitchen patty, uh, kitchen counter as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. So what's the proper way to plant? And this is some of the uh, uh, things we're gonna go through at the demo this Saturday. Um, one of the ways that we traditionally use uh, in our beds, since we have the raised beds, is to plant them what we call lying down. Tomatoes are one of the few plants that you can, they say you can plant them deep. And what that means is you can see how big these tomatoes are on your left, how long they are. Uh, we'll just dig a trench, the width wise of the bed, lay the tomato down and I'll clip off all the lower limbs that you see. And just the w one quarter of that plant that's left, you can see in the center picture, I just lift it up and, and then I'll support it with a stake. Um, so that whole width of the uh, bed is actually gonna be a nice hardy root system to, su to support that uh, plant. Um, and when you do it that way, we turn them around, as you can see in the, uh, the left and the center picture, and it's harder to see on the right-hand side, but it looks like you have a very nicely staggered plant from one side to the next, which again, that really promotes good separation uh, of the plants so they can all get lots of air circulation and uh, sunlight as well. Next slide. So as you can see out uh, at the top picture is uh, really the ideal way. We do about nine plants per bed um, and you can see they're nicely staggered. Um, I'll talk a little bit about pruning. I don't know if you, maybe if you squint real hard, you can see that the lower, the lower limbs of our plants have very few leaves on them. Uh, and when we get into pruning, which will be next, I'll tell you why we do that. Uh, one thing you don't want to do is what I did one of the first times I started planting <coughs> um, plants in my raised bed at home was in March, I put about 20 uh, tomato plants, which all looked great in March. Uh, but then in May time frame, I had a mess. You can see on the lower right, it was just a mess of tomato plant everywhere. I couldn't really tend to them easily. Um, and so that's kind of like learn your lesson the hard way. Uh, next slide, please. So it comes down to, do I stake them or do I cage my tomatoes? Well, you can do either. We do both. When they're very young, we will uh, stake the tomato plant to help it start growing upright. And then we'll put cages around them. Um, you can see the, the, the pluses and minuses. But if you're going to stake, you want to get a, a stake that's at least six feet uh, in, in length. Um, Make sure you put it on the outside. Don't stake the plant where you just put the root system. Um, and you'll want to uh, uh, attach the tomato plant to the stake about every 12 inches or so as it grows. A great fastening tool is just a, a twist tie. It works perfect. That's what we use out of the garden. Um, and it always seems like we have a drawer of a million twist ties when you buy those storage bags at the grocery store. Um, caging, uh, some of the benefits are, people think it, minim it minimizes pruning uh, requirements, uh, therefore it's less maintenance. Well, I still prune when we're even in cages. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about pruning. Again, that, so I blew up that picture I showed you at the uh, uh, earlier. Um, so the one on the bottom right, shows that there's very little growth or leaves um, on the lower part of the uh, tomato. And that is to prevent uh, early blight, which is a fungal disease on tomatoes. 
when tomato leaves touch the ground, they tend to, tend to stay more wet and uh, will promote uh, things like early blight. You'll also want to look in the uh, axle of the plant, which is right between the, uh, the stem and the branches that grow out. You'll see uh, little suckers uh, in there. You want to pull those out and just pinch those out with your fingers if, uh, or you can prune them with shears. Um, uh, but they will just take nutrients away from the plant and will, will not uh, allow for the uh, uh, most of the nutrients to go to the flowers, which is where you want them, because that's what turns into your tomatoes. For a lot of our indeterminate tomatoes, which means they'll just continue to grow versus a determinate tomato is a, more of a set height. Um, we will also cut off the growing tip, as you can see on that one uh, on the diagram I'm showing. Um, and that is to prevent uh, the picture on the lower uh, right from ending up with 10, 12 foot tall tomatoes, which nobody really needs a 10 foot tomato. N uh, none of your fruit will grow up that high. So we will tend to cut off the growing tip after it gets to the height we want it and then continue to maintain and prune the plant. Next slide. So one of the questions we always hear is when to pick your tomatoes. Um, you can see here we have a the what we call the uh, ripening chart, if you will, and it starts out uh, your tomato at stage one, which is the upper left hand side, uh, which is basically it's uh, a, a new tomato, just very green. Uh, as you develop to stage two, it starts to get a little bit more color in it. If it's in our example here, we have a red tomato. Um, or if you have a purple tomato, it's going to start turning the purple or the yellow and so on. Um, and then you get to stage three and it's about 30 percent or so is that coloration. You go on to stage four, five and six. Six is basically we're saying it's ripe. It's 90 percent color. It's time to eat it. Um, so one of the questions we always tend to get is how do I keep birds and squirrels away from my nice ripe tomatoes? I think I'm gonna go grab this one tomorrow because it looks like it's just perfect and almost there, but needs one more day on the vine and you come and it's half eaten. Well, the best way to stop those varmints from getting your tomato is to pick it at, at stage three, what we call the turning stage. Um, generally, a lot of birds and uh, squirrels will not munch on these uh, tomatoes when they're early at this stage. And then just put the tomato on the uh, on your kitchen counter. And in a matter of a week or two, it'll ripen and go all the way to stage six. If you pick it too early, you're going to end up with just green tomatoes, which you can do a lot with green tomatoes as well. Um, but so... The key, if you have a varmint issue in your neighborhood, is pick your tomatoes early and let them ripen indoors. Next slide. So what are some of the pests we see um, out there? Uh, well, tomato horn, uh, hornworm is one of the big ones. You can just see those. Uh, our pest management practices start with the most environmentally sensitive uh, or friendly way, and then it will eventually graduate to chemicals. But we hope we never have to get to the strong chemical. So that's what I'm listing here. For example, on the hornworms, uh, number one, pick them off with your hand and, and throw, them, throw them out. Um, you can use insecticidal soaps. Um, if you want to get, if you uh, have a, a bad infestation, you can get to the uh, BT stage, which is now starting to add um, it's still uh, organic, but it's uh, getting stronger and stronger. And then, of course, seven is a, a, a chemical solution. Uh, Leaf-footed bugs, which we seem to have a problem with. I show a picture in that circle uh, at the top. They're also known as stink bugs. They have a piercing, sucking mouth part that will uh, they'll stick, stick that into the tomatoes to get the nutrients that they need. Uh, but they'll put terrible blemishes on the tomatoes. And if you have a big enough problem, uh, they'll, the tomatoes will not be edible, uh, even at that point. Uh, neem oil and uh, spinosat are, are good first starts uh, on that one. 
Um, and the early blight, which I talked about earlier, uh, the easiest way uh, to control early blight is just to pick those leaves off and throw them away, uh, I feel. But you can see some other solutions that are listed there as well. Next slide. And then finally, uh, oh, finally, the uh, varieties uh, that work the best in Harris County. Uh, if you like large, uh, a, a large indeterminate variety is the brandy wine. They're going to be more than the 16 ounce of tomato. Celebrity is a great medium type, more than the 12 ounce range. Um, some, for some reason, the picture of my Roma tomato uh, has gone, but Roma tomatoes are great in this part of the country. And I also mentioned Juliet's, uh, if you like the smaller type tomato that are very tasty. Next slide. Okay, now we're gonna move on to other vegetables and I'll go at a much faster pace <laughs> at these. So peppers, for example, uh, when you go to your local nursery, you'll want a transplant that's good four to six inches tall. Um, you can see the fertil fertilizer rates that we have there. Again, in prepping your beds, you're gonna want, they have, we have here two to three pounds of a good uh, complete fertilizer. So let me just explain the difference on why we use four pounds per hundred square feet. And then we recommend here two to three pounds. So you can see we're recommending a 10, 10, 10. Um, what we use out at the garden is a six to four. So it has less nutrients. So it, hence we use more fertilizer. Um, the single plants, if you're just doing single plants, uh, a couple of tablespoons of good uh, complete fertilizer works great. Um, you'll want to, to uh, add some more f fertilizer when you, uh, you get your first fruits. Uh, harvesting peppers usually takes in the uh, eight to 10 week time frame. Um, and you want to pick them when they're nice and shiny and firm. Next slide, please. Varieties that work great in Harris County, the Hildago Serrano, if you like the hot peppers, uh, good jalapeno, uh, peppers, uh, is a great variety that works here in South Texas as well. Big Bertha is a really nice bell pepper or sweet pepper. And the summer sweet is another nice bell pepper for this climate. Next slide. And who can, uh, what presenter can't talk about peppers without having the uh, Scoville unit heat chart? So if you're really uh, liking spicy peppers, just find you one of these charts and go pick yourself one of the uh, ones that are much higher in the heat range, uh, and uh, go for it. Next slide. Eggplants very uh, is popular as well. You'll want to fertilize those again. You're going to see this over and over. The two to three pounds of ten, 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 or a nice complete fertilizer. Um, you'll want to apply it twice. <clears throat> you want to apply about half of it at planting. And then the other half at first fruit. Um, eggplants usually harvest within uh, 60 to 80 days after transplanting. Um, and you'll want to get them when they're about a third uh, of their uh, full size. Uh, the, the, they're more delicate and delicious, I feel, at that point. Next slide. Varieties of eggplants that work great in Harris County. Well, the Black Beauty is, is a wonderful uh, eggplant. Uh, there's just such a variety of eggplants that will work down here. The early uh, long purple is a wonderful, if you like white eggplant, it's just called white eggplant. Um, you, a lot of Japanese eggplants work in this area. Um, if you prefer yellow eggplants. Uh, and on those charts uh, or the website I told you about earlier uh, on different varieties uh, that work in Harris County, there's a lot more listed there as well. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about legumes or beans. So green beans, lima beans, southern peas, so on. Next slide. So some great uh, beans, uh, both bush beans and pole beans. Uh, they can be planted in the March-April time frame and then again in September. Uh, they usually take anywhere from 55 to 80 days, depending on the variety. Um, the bush beans, they actually mature faster than the pole beans. So if you're in a hurry for your beans, that's something to consider. 
Uh, you'll want to harvest them when they're young and tender uh, and pick them frequently, kind of like okra, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And you can see on the fertilizing, again, the standard two to three pounds per hundred square feet. Next slide. So what varieties work great? Well, a good pole bean is the Blue Lake that works well in this area. And if you're looking for more of the bush bean, it's the Roma 2 that works really good in this area as well. Next slide. Um, southern peas. Uh, again, you can plant these a little bit later now in the uh, April to July. They like it warm, uh, which we have a lot of warmth in, in the July time frame. Um, you'll use a uh, moderate fertilized soil. Um, you'll want to harvest them when the pods just start to turn uh, and mature and they'll start turning yellow. And nitrogen are, I mean, uh, uh, peas and beans are really good plants to what we call their nitrogen fixing plants. They'll actually add nitrogen to your soil. Uh, most plants absorb or take it away. Uh, so beans are a good rota rotation crop with tomatoes or peppers. Next slide. Uh, varieties for Harris County I have listed here. So if you like the southern bean, the uh, black eyed number five or the champion cream, you can see if, uh, if you like the English peas or if you like snap peas. Again, there's the website again that you can find uh, all the varieties you want in Harris County. Next slide. Some common problems with lagoons um, are what we call the pea aphid. Uh, they're little aphids that will run and just basically uh, destroy your, your, your crop. Um, the uh, late, uh, ladybird beetle or yeah, the, uh, will help clean up. They love to eat the aphids and they'll clean them right up or you can just wash them off with high pressure uh, spray. Uh, do that early in the morning. Um, a soapy water works well. Horticultural oils work. Um, and if you get to an infestation that is just totally out of control, then you might have to go the uh, chemical route. Uh, and that would be either the malathion or the seven. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the gourd family, the curcurbits. Uh, these are your squashes, your cucumbers, melons, uh, pumpkin, and a variety of gourds. Next slide. So summer squash is great. Uh, it needs space. Um, we plant these in the March to April time frame. Uh, again, you've got a huge variety from zucchini to yellow uh, and also scalloped type uh, squashes. Uh, same fertilizing routine. Um, You'll want to put uh, a few plants, so two to three, uh, you'll want to fertilize them two to three tablespoons per plant um, uh, when you're first planting them. And then again, at first bloom, about another two tablespoons. Um, next slide. So as uh, you may or may not know, but uh, squash have both male and female flowers on them. The uh, picture on the upper picture on the right is a male flower. You can see at the very stem at at the very start of the flower, it's just a regular stem. Whereas the picture on the lower right, that at the base of the flower, you can see the little squash starting. That's the female squash uh, or the female flower that actually produces the fruit. Next slide. Varieties that work great in Harris County. Well, you've got your butter bar, which is a yellow straight neck type uh, squash. Uh, Dixie, which is a crook neck uh, squash. Um, you've got a whole variety like the Peter Pan works well, the butternut and out at um, our, our garden at uh, Genoa Friendship Gardens, we have a uh, been traveling for a couple of years now and it's working well, the Tatuma squash. Um, it's touted as being uh, highly resistant to the squash borer beetle, uh, which is one of the most detrimental things to squash. Um, and it does seem to be a bit resistant to, to the beetle itself. Next slide. 
Cucumbers. Um, cucumbers are great. They work well in this climate. You can either do go with the slicing or the pickling varieties. Um, again, plant these in March to April timeframe. Um, th they're a vine crop, so they do need space, or you can trellis them. As you see in the upper picture, we have these in a, uh, some of our bins, and we just trellis them. Put a trellis in there, and they climb right up the trellis. Um, again, fertilizing about a cup uh, for each 10-foot uh, row, so just a different measurement type. Um, and you can see you'll want to um, fertilize at a variety of times throughout the growing season as well with these. Next slide. So good varieties that work here in Harris County. Well, if you're looking for a pickling uh, cucumber, the uh, Country Fair is excellent. Uh, slicing cucumber, the burpless is a, a wonderful uh, variety as well. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about melons. Um, the uh, depends what type of melons uh, you like, but again, they're a later crop. Uh, the April to June time frame is, is ideal. You'll want uh, small amounts of a couple of applications of fertilizer. Um, again, half of this amount at planting and half when they, the vines begin to run. Um, you can either let, uh, allow your melon to be on the ground, but it usually will tend to get a very soft spot. So some people will trellis their melons and then hold them, uh, tie them to the trellis with just the old standard pantyhose trick, uh, tie them up there because the uh, vine will not support the heavy melon. Or you can put, we have little tray, uh, tray type uh, applications that you can put underneath the melon and it keeps it off the ground as well. Next slide. Varieties that work great here are the uh, Cam Uvalde, which is a, a cantaloupe type. Uh, we've also got the uh, Tam Dew Melon, which is a honeydew type, and um, Ambrosia works well in, in our climate as well. Next slide. Common problems you have with uh, curcubits um, are powdery mildew, uh, which is because uh, the stressors that cause it are high humidity, extreme temperature, and too much or too little water. Uh, and that pretty much describes Houston summers right there. Um, so the best way to care for it is just to remove the leaves. Um, the squash bore, uh, squash vine bore beetle, which I have a picture in the center, really doesn't do anything to, to your plant. It's the uh, Larvae, they, the eggs they lay is what ends up killing your plant. They will uh, uh, lay the eggs and then the, the little larvae will bore into the vines of the squash, for example, um, and just eat, eat their way through the vine, which will kill the plant. Um, and squash bugs, which I talked about earlier on the tomatoes, they're also uh, detrimental for the uh, uh, curcubit family as well. Next slide. Let's talk about okra. A lot of people uh, like okra. I know are the people that visit the pantry that we service uh, love the okra. So we grow it every year. Um, the planting time again is April through July. Um, harvest five to uh, or 50 to 60 days. You'll wanna put these plants about two feet apart because they will get rather large. Uh, you can see the fertilizing applications we have there. Um, okra is uh, 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 very um, prolific. Uh, so you'll be picking okra um, multiple times a week for sure. <laughs> Every other day. Um, you, you want them to get to the three to four inches in length. Once they get much bigger than this, they tend to get a little woody and not quite as uh, tender. Um, and you can always uh, take one off, let it dry, and save the seeds for next year if you find an okra you really like. Next slide. Uh, nematodes are a, a big problem uh, in the okra family. And basically, ne nematodes are just a microscopic worm that lives in the soil. Um, some nematodes are beneficial. Um, 
and, and some are harmful. Uh, and once you get a infestation of nematodes, uh, of the harmful nematodes in your beds, there is really no, uh, no way to treat them, <coughs> excuse me, treat them with uh, uh, chemicals or such. So what you have to do is um, uh, either cover what we call a cover crop, which is shown on the upper right. Um, and Bermuda grass is, is one cover crop that base, and you have to get a nematode resistant grass um, that will just basically smother them out. Or you can, uh, what we call uh, soil solarization, which means you just cover that bed uh, with a dark plastic, um, but it takes that bed out of production for at least uh, uh, one of the growing seasons. And it will basically bake the nematodes and kill them that way. Next slide. So a couple of varieties of uh, okra that we like is the Cajun Delight um, and the uh, Burgundy. If you like different colored okras, the, they taste pretty much identical. It's just, uh, I think the mixture of the two looks pretty out there. Uh, and again, I'm showing the website where you can get um, all the varieties you want that work great in Harris County. Next slide. So what we've gone through is, um, in, in summary, we've selected a sunny location. We talked about preparing the soil prior to planting. We talked a bit about what are the correct varieties to use uh, in South Texas, uh, when to plant, the planting times, uh, talked a bit about mulch and the benefits of mulch. Uh, on how to control uh, weeds and disease and, and uh, those types of things. We talked a bit about watering, uh, when is uh, proper watering, and again, a bit about harvest uh, at optimal times. Um, next slide, please. So thanks again for uh, supporting um, uh, this area by listening to the uh, show and um, uh, one last slide. Oh. And don't forget, if you're interested in uh, signing up for uh, our tomato planting workshop, um, it'll be this Saturday at Genoa Friendship Gardens. Uh, John, are there any other questions? Man, I'll tell you what, Rick, I don't know if you knew this or not, but you are a rock star, my friend, because the <laughs> phone lines have been exploding with questions. Uh, great, great. We have a lot to them, and we're going to try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, a great show. I'm really, uh, really uh, so informative. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, you bet. Let's just get into some of these questions. Um, Janine T., uh, she wanted to know, is MicroLife pellet fertilizer suitable to use when planting transplants, even though it is not a 10-10-10? So MicroLife, we use uh, the 624 in preparing the bed. So we'll put that down about uh, one to two weeks prior to planting. Okay. And okay. then I like the faster release. <laughs> I'm not sure there's such a thing, but it's not slow release uh, to supplement during the growing season for tomatoes, for example. Okay. One of the things, one of the questions was, uh, uh, and thank you so much, Teresa, for asking this. Uh, I was asking about if this program was recorded. And yes, um, this program has been recorded. Um, there's a lot of information that uh, Rick obviously went over. And you can be able to find uh, uh, recordings of this on the Harris County Master Gardeners page, uh, the Facebook page, uh, Harris County Public Library's website. I believe it might be on the the very front of the homepage for uh, until we have our next uh, next show. Also, you can find it on YouTube as well. So, thank you, Teresa, for that question about um, being able to view this again. Um, Selma asked um, if you uh, if you if a compost holds moisture, do you recommend not applying mulch on top? No, we would always. Uh, 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 I assume she's saying that you mix the compost in like we do into the soil about the first uh, four to six, maybe even eight inches deep. Uh, once you've done that, no, mulch is, is good to use on top to just lay it on top. Again, it uh, uh, eliminates weeding mm -hmm. for the most part and it'll help regulate the soil temperature besides keeping moisture in. 
And what about just good old fashioned pine needles? I mean, our yep. our yard, we got, you know, we rake them up. I mean, this seems like there's a, <laughs> if, if they're worth money, I'd be a, I'd be a very rich man. If I, <laughs> yep. pine needles work just fine. Okay, good. Um, and now Mona asked Mona K, um, if the label says the plant is resistant to various issues, does that mean that the plant is genetically modified? When you're looking yes, at the, yeah, I mean, it has been modified at some stage to, to make it more resistant. And it takes years and years to get plants resistant to certain um, ailments, if we will. But okay. yes, so they have been modified uh, from plants that are naturally resistant. But um, maybe and, not so much with the, uh, you know, in a way that is, would be certainly not in a way that would be harmful to. No. If you're, if no. You're gonna, oh, good, good. Right. It's from other natural plants, I think. Other natural plants. Okay, yeah. great. Um, uh, I don't know if we can answer this one too much or if this might just be something that they would want to, you know, uh, a question they would, someone would send into the uh, Harris County Master and Gardener website. But uh, had some different people asking about recommendations for specific local you know, places to buy gardening soil, potting mix, compost. Um, are you, do you, one, do you mention specific stores and places or local businesses or? Uh, not really. And it depends where, where somebody would live. Um, okay. And I, I would say if you're just starting out uh, gardening, a, a, a good show to listen to, uh, I'm not advertising for it, is Garden Line, which happens on weekends on 740. Mm -hmm. And one of our local agents is now the host of that, Skip Richter. Uh, host that show and they talk about where to get good garden soil constantly on that show that was the show that uh randy lemon who is that correct yes. yeah who sadly passed away uh, right in lost and uh, I, I right so <laughs> that's a good source as well for places to get okay. nurseries um, now you talked a little bit about squirrels and uh, you know uh, and how to when to pick the uh, the tomatoes and the fruits okay. to get them you know to kind of I mean obviously trying to outwit a squirrel is there anything else uh, you know as far as netting it Mark is having problems uh, you know he's got a net they're still getting in we I've had problems with uh, squirrels uh, anything right. is it just one of those you live in Houston you got squirrels yeah pretty much uh, <laughs> yeah the um... Uh, unless you can catch them somehow <laughs> and cage them up. Um, you can get a dog. Hey, there you yeah, go. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I've tried all kinds of different uh, remedies, uh, like all kinds of different urine scent things, and that are uh, nothing seems to work. So I just pick them early. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's the wise yeah. move. Um, and then a couple of great questions from Lynn, which we'll close out with these. Uh, Lynn G wanted to know. Um, uh, why tomatoes from the grocery store never ripen further? Um, how uh, and should you put tomatoes in a very sunny windowsill? Would that uh, any? Yeah, sunny windowsill works better uh, than non not sunny. Um, but the tomatoes you get at the grocery store are made to stay exactly the way you bought them. <laughs> so and those we're those not going to tell you what kind of yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what chemicals they use on them, but they do use some. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Lynn also want to know why grow determinate tomatoes if you're not going to be making tomato sauce or paste? Um, well, um, not sure that has to do with a determinate. There are different varieties. Um, determinates are just tomatoes that will grow a certain size and stay that size. Okay. Is, uh, um, and yes, some of the Romas are determinate. Uh, which are excellent for pastes, uh, okay. tomato sauces, and that type of thing. Okay, so you, if yeah. you want to go, if you are going to be making, a, you know, a, you can eat them anyway. But if you're going to be right. making paste, you definitely. And we'll, we'll make tomato sauce out of just about any tomato <laughs> here at this house. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. I'm I'm waiting for my uh, my dinner invitation, Ray. Okay. <laughs> um, a couple of quick things before we close out here. I definitely want to thank uh, Robin, Joanne, Lynette. Uh, these are some people who have been answering questions uh, in all the different chat formats uh, we've had. Um, you know, comments coming in from both Facebook or from Facebook, YouTube, uh, from the StreamYard and the Master Gardener site. And they've all been helping out with the questions and answering. So please, uh, thank you, though. Thank you to, uh, to those guys. Also, a reminder that we're going to be we are here every month. Um, we are here on the um, 
uh, the third Tuesday of every month, obviously at 11 o'clock. Our next show is going to be on March 21st, and that's going to be the benefits of growing native plants, the benefits of growing native plants, uh, which you definitely want to take out. And Rick, I believe you will be joining us again this year. Is that correct? In the Will be in uh, July time frame. In July time frame. Okay, right in the middle of summer. Oh, well, we look forward to it. Um, right. Once again, if you guys have questions, keep them coming. Uh, we will get to make sure those get answered um, uh, even after this is uh, uh, done. We can, you can send those into the Master Gardeners. Uh, check out their website. Also, you want to make sure and uh, uh, join Rick for the February 25th, 25th Green Thumb Tomato Planting Workshop. Uh, anything else you want to mention about that workshop that's uh, uh, mentioned right there on the uh, screen? No, nope, you'll get the take home at least uh, one tomato plant, some fertilizer with you. Go plant that's, yourself. That's a great deal. I uh, I look forward to it. Rick, thank you so much for uh, uh, your presentation. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I just want to say thank you again to everybody that helped out. And also, I guess we will see see you guys next month on March 21st for benefits of growing native plants. <laughs> thank you, John. Bye-bye, guys, everybody.